Voices serves as the megaphone for individuals who have endured transformational change. By highlighting trials and triumphs, our desire is to create a safe space for pivotal conversations, which in turn will deepen the story and provoke hope for you, our listeners. As you may know, change is never easy, but it is inevitable. You are not alone in what you're facing. Your transformation is possible, purposeful, and now. And here's Aaron Wiggum, founder and managing director of New You, with this week's guest. Welcome to another edition of New Voices. We have a very special guest today. Um, this woman here is an amazing thought leader. Uh, she is a nurturer by nature. Um, she is a profound thinker. Um, she taught me fashion at a very young age and many other things. Um, she really is unstoppable. And I love the fact that I get to call her my sister. There is no one like her on earth. I'm telling you that. Um, she, uh, she is very well versed in what we're about to speak about today. And so I want you to welcome none other than my beautiful and wonderful sister, Sheree Lachou. Welcome, Sheree. Thank you. I love that introduction. That was like my power boost for the day. Look at that. See, she, got, <laughs> she got a little Joda energy now. Look at that. Um, she is a, you know, a licensed um, marriage and therapy uh, consultant. And um, we want to lean on her expertise as we go through this conversation. Uh, so, Sheree, we're going to have a conversation a little bit around personal things, a little bit around professional things. All right. And we, we want to inform our, our listeners from a variety of aspects. So let's go back to the beginning. Uh, you're from Pittsburgh. We grew up in the same house, same parents. And um, I want to know from your lens, what was your what was your upbringing like from your lens? Yeah. Wow. I think that is like a layered basket. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> So one, I want to say thank you, Aaron, for um, bringing me on the show because, yes, I am. I'm the middle child of, of three, technically four, y'all. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, growing up, it was a very interesting, it was a very mixed bag of things. It was a great experience overall, I would say, and I think it did a lot of character building. Um, but we grew up in, you know, when you think about like where you grow up and what creates you, we grew up in a suburb of Pittsburgh uh, called Wilkinsburg, born and raised. Uh, we had a, a family that was small and close knit. Um, you thought about it. It was a lot of connection, lots of gatherings, lots of food, mm -hmm. lots of relationships. Right. And a lot of God, mm -hmm. you know, and so I think. At the, you know, at the base of it, that is the foundation that I have and that I still continue to build from. Um, the challenges of it, though, were I didn't know back when I was growing up that I was ADHD. Mm -hmm. And back then, especially for a little black girl, that wasn't something wasn't unless you arm. Yeah. No, it yeah. wasn't. And we didn't even know about it, I think, right. maybe till high school. Mm -hmm. And even still, it was typically young white adolescents that were diagnosed with it um, or, or boys because they were maybe destructive or had behavioral issues. And so growing up, I was a thinker. I was mm -hmm. super curious. <laughs> I'm sure you remember that. Yeah. Um, I spoke out of turn a lot of times, which didn't always land me in uh, grown ups graces. Mm -hmm. um, but I was really inquisitive, very curious. Uh, I taught myself to read when I was about four. Mm -hmm. And I just had a desire to learn, to learn more about me, about other people, about different worlds. And so reading back then was my escape. Mm -hmm. I read, 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 read Avid and read reading. some more. Yeah. Yes. Up all so night I'm sure. Reading. Up all night, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe get a beating in the morning. Stop, <laughs> cut the lights out. Time to go to church in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, you know, it was, it was a, it was an experience for me because what I didn't know then is that I was looking for moments to grab mm -hmm. to escape my own reality. Sometimes, while uh, we had very loving parents, we, we still do thankfully have very loving parents. Mm -hmm. Our parents had to parent us from where they were, and they were very young. 
They mm-hmm. took on a great deal of responsibility. We're four years apart. I'm the middle child. Uh, and then we had our uncle, our blood uncle, our mother's youngest brother, who came to live with us when their mother passed. And our mom was only 24, had just mm-hmm. had you. And so in that experience, it was and it was literally like, I want to say we buried her the week of my birthday, of my fourth birthday. Mm-hmm. So there was a lot of needs and they gave from what they could. Right. But what I realized very early on is my needs were going to take up too much space. Mm-hmm. So I learned how to shrink my needs at times. And then I learned how to be what I thought was a servant leader. But really what it was is I learned to be a pretty much a placator and a people pleaser mm-hmm. because that was how I was forming my identity. Right. Like, how could I be of service to other people in order to have value or have worth? Mm-hmm. So that was the challenging part, because in that space, you feel like you're acknowledged for what you can do for others or how not you can you accomplish are. things. Not mm-hmm. net not who you are. And I think that was the pain point that um, I realized back then. I never had like a group of friends. Mm -hmm. I had people who I was friends with, but there was no real sense of belonging Mm -hmm. outside of those groups of friends kept moving on. And then I would find another friend and then that person would bring me into the friend group, but they were a group and I was just the the external friend. So you realize that you don't have a sense of belonging anywhere you go. And I found solace actually in going to my grandmother's house a lot. Mm -hmm. So while, you know, no kid really wants to be at their grandmother's all the time. That's where I got that extra dosage of nurturing from Mm -hmm. my grandparents, uh, who I felt like for me were like my second parents. They were Mm -hmm. the ones that had the time and the focus to pay the attention sometimes that I felt like just that extra measure that I needed, because I know that Um, My parents were just overextended. They had a lot of people needing them and kind of pulling on them, family and and friends. Okay. All right. So, uh, of course, we went to private school and um, post private school, you went uh, off to get your degree. Um, Mm -hmm. And let's talk about that that transition from high school to college and your college experience. Like what what made you. what was your impetus for going to school for one? And then um, what made you make some of the choices that you made when you studied, um, you know, did the transfer program and did the, some of the calls that you made, what what, what led to that uh, throughout your yeah. journey? Were you kind of winging it or was it to be with friends or was yeah. it something where you uh, just were kind of not, you didn't have your steps ordered. You just were kind of, yeah. you know, following your, your own uh, in, inclinations. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great question. So when it comes to kind of how I figured out where I was supposed to be in life and what what's the next step in front of me and then what's yeah. that step, I definitely feel like I was probably about 15 where I felt like there was a call on my life. And people mm-hmm. at church would say, you know, Sister Donna, she has a call on her life. And they would, you know, church folks would say, oh, you're going to be an evangelist. Mm -hmm. Back then, I didn't realize evangelism really is just living and speaking about Christ, you know, so anybody could be an evangelist. But I was like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be in a church, like speaking around to everybody. Um, But I knew that I had a call on my life to to provide healing. What Mm -hmm. I didn't know then, though, is you could provide something, you could be a vessel and provide something and not realize that your levels of that same something are detrimental. Not there. Low. Yes. You could be low and be right. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, so they were non-existent. So I was healing from a wounded space, even wow. as a kid, even when I was, you know, five, six, 12, 18, 21, I was healing others, Mm -hmm. right? Because I did have that gift of healing and I did have like a a prophetic gift where I would just know things were going to happen. And I tell, you know, I I told our our mother that I knew something was going to happen. Right. And and Mm -hmm. she said, okay. What I didn't realize though, is all those things were siphoning Mm -hmm. from me and I wasn't replenishing. They were never being replaced. They, they weren't replenished. So, um, I would say about 15 that I knew that there was global impact that I was supposed to have on the world. Right. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I was called to do something greater. But I tell my clients this all the time. And for those of you out there that are hearing this, I'm sure you can tap into it. There is a knowing that, you know, so my gift of intuition for me, I believe it comes from God directly from above. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would just have that gut knowing 
that would cause anxiety in me. So I'd often have stomach aches. It would come up in this somatic experience in a headache, a stomach ache. I'd just get weepy all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And so it would cause this anxiety because it was a knowing that I had. I knew that I was required to do things. I knew I couldn't do all the same things. When my friends were getting high back in the chronic days, Mm -hmm. you know, because I was in the streets back out then in the 90s. -hmm. And so my girlfriends were getting high and drinking. I couldn't do the same things that they did the same way. Mm -hmm. And so it set me up part in a way that I didn't like. I had an extra measure of accountability. Y'all, when they say ignorance is bliss, it really is Yeah, because you get to enjoy things and not understand the ramifications of what you're enjoying. right? Right. I knew very early on that I was called to do so much more. And so I had to watch how I moved Mm. when I made pivots and did those things that I knew that I shouldn't do. They Mm. were often catastrophic one. And two, I couldn't even do them with like freedom and peace because I already knew Mm. that there were ramifications for what I was doing. Mm. So when it went from, you know, me being in elementary school, I went to a predominantly black um, school in Wilkinsburg and there was a sense of community there. And then Mm. when we went to um, our, our, what was for you really pretty Mm -hmm. much elementary through Mm -hmm. 12th grade. But for me, it was sixth grade through 12th grade to a Christian predominantly white private school. um, Microaggressions aren't even half of it. Like Mm -hmm. I really experienced a lot of racism, like blatant Mm -hmm. racism. Mm -hmm. Um, I experienced a lot of sexism. Mm -hmm. I experienced a lot of um, religious trauma. Mm -hmm. If classism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and a lot of religious trauma. And so that was very difficult for me because even the other folks that look like me that went there, Mm -hmm. they didn't understand the language of people that didn't share our same skin tone. So they would often think things were someone just being nice and not recognizing the microaggressions that were hidden in between. And unfortunately I knew them. And so, um, Yeah, the subtlety and when they say things and people want part of black culture, but don't really have a reverence or a regard for black people. Yeah, absolutely. So I was used to being the girl who had to have someone that didn't look like her co-sign what I said for everyone to think it was a great idea. So that showed me very early on that it didn't matter the level of intelligence that I thought I had to offer. Mm -hmm. Someone else that doesn't look like me has to validate or recognize it, whether it's a male or whether it's someone that has has white skin. Right. Mm -hmm. That was hard because. I knew that my parents' goal was get me educated and get me quality education and protect me from the perils of the world that could be very evil. So they did it with the best of intentions. But and I maintain this at all of 45 years of age, it was very harmful to my development, my growth and development. And so what I took away from that experience is I'm not an academic. I really mm-hmm. did not want to go to college. I don't know if you remember, but when I was 17, I was working at a hair salon. I went mm-hmm. to L.A., wanted to be a singer. Mm-hmm. And so when I got the scholarship to go to California University of Pennsylvania, I felt like this is crushing. This mm-hmm. is crushing my dream. I didn't even want to do this. And I was I was made to do it because my parents said this is an opportunity you're missing. So unfortunately for me, my undergraduate years was a lot of me figuring it out for a lot of money Mm. That was on me to pay. Mm -hmm. And so I was figuring out where I wanted to go in life, but more so my identity. The way that I landed, I changed my major. I don't know how many times. And Mm -hmm. those of y'all out there in in the land that are ADHD. And most recently, I realized also that autism plays a part with me. Right. Mm -hmm. Or that maybe autistic, you may be feeling out of sorts with yourself and wondering, like, where am I supposed to be Mm -hmm. and where do I fit in? And that was a very expensive lesson. But looking back, no, no experience that you have is without a nugget that you can take from it. it. And so the biggest nuggets that I took from that experience of transitioning and saying, okay, I'm going to college, but I'm going to college for my parents. So deeply I'm resentful and I owe a balance Mm -hmm. and I'm going to get out of this program, right? With this degree and not even know what I'm going to do in life. I left school in 1999 when all my peers were graduating. I left with no degree. I left and went immediately into um, being a counselor at a group home. Mm -hmm. And I worked in the field of behavioral health and psychology because in the state of PA, you could provide those services with enough education Mm -hmm. and experience. And so you could be a therapist. So I became a therapist 
I became a group home counselor in 99, a therapist in uh, 2001. I was an in-home family therapist, but I still had no degree. So, yo, I mean, I was making $7 an hour, $20,000 a year, no real living wage. And even more, I was finding myself in a in a broken space where I got with someone, aligned myself with someone who wasn't a bad person, but didn't know how to be a husband. And it was a very abusive and toxic marriage. Mm -hmm. So that was further depletion. Mm -hmm. And so now we in this space where it's early 2000s, I have no degree, lots of debt because y'all, they will get you with those credit cards, right? So lots of debt, no degree, and a feeling of somehow I felt myself, I betrayed myself, and then I also felt my family. Mm. Yeah. Wow. So that that's a perfect segue. Wow, it's almost like you knew where I was taking you. That's a perfect segue. Where you're going through this this time period, right? And mm-hmm. you feel like I'm trying to do good for people, and I don't feel good happening to and for me, right? Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about some of the the the, the dark moments. Like where you had to grapple mm. with, you had to you had to pull on that foundation that you were given as a child. Uh, you had to pull on the roots of your faith, or you know, what, what one? What did you pull on? But you had to yeah. dig down in the reservoir of who you are um, to then resurrect to who you've never been before, right? How yeah. how did talk us through that period a little bit? And then talk us about what it felt like coming out of that, almost like a rebirthing of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that you say that, um, because when I think about what are some of those dark moments, some of those low spaces, some of those Mm -hmm. Phoenix rising from the ashes Mm -hmm. type moments where I had to learn that if I didn't adjust and bend, I will break. Mm. I'll break completely. Wow. And so when I think back to those moments, there they were plenty, but the ones that were the most um, momentous, I'll say, or the most significant and impactful in where I am today are remembering when I was a child, uh, when I was maybe about five or six and mm. recognizing that I could understand people's behaviors and actions and what that meant, mm. but no one was attuned to me, right? Mm. So attunement you know, for those out there in the listening world is basically when someone gets how you're feeling. If I see you look in a certain way, I know if that's sadness or if Mm -hmm. that's despair, or if you don't feel worthy or if you feel frustrated or angry. Mm -hmm. And so I could intuitively know what my father was feeling, what my mother was feeling, what my little brother was feeling, what, Mm -hmm. what my older sister was feeling, what my friends were feeling. And somewhere around five, I realized I don't have that. I didn't know it was called attunement. What I knew is I could be sitting by my closet or in my closet or underneath the counter. And what that would look like to someone is I'm just being dramatic. But Mm -hmm. really what it was is I was either in sensory overload and I had to go in or I felt alone. And so I made myself physically be alone because I felt alone. Right. And so another moment that um, really stuck out for me was recognizing when I realized that um, a lot of my peers, a lot of my black peers in school didn't understand what microaggressions were Mm. and felt like some of the attempts of folks that didn't look like us were to be nice, right? Mm -hmm. And I realized that there was a difference. I realized in church that I didn't know that church had like church groupies. And like, Mm -hmm. I just assumed everybody was like, you know, you love God. And so you want to do well for yourself and for others, because that's kind of how we grew up. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that there were church politics. And Mm -hmm. so I became very astute around those at, you know, age 13, 14, 15. And I remember there was a rumor made up about me by one of the ladies in the church. And when I say it hit me hard, it hit me hard. And I had to address this with this woman in front of my mother. Mm -hmm. And I thought my mom would try to hold me back. She did not. And so that affirmed me in a way, but it was a dark moment because in my mind, especially with that people pleasing nature, I was always trying to make others happy. And and I realized that I couldn't. And instead of it making me stop, try, I continued. I just did more. Yeah. Uh, another moment was, and I got a chance to speak to my father about it. And y'all validation is real because it, it was 
brought closure, but I remember being sick a lot Mm -hmm. and being sick for lengthy periods of time. And it was a crushing moment when I realized that my illness was not recognized the same. So if I was sick, I preferred to go to my grandparents' house than to stay at home Mm -hmm. because typically there was a thought that you couldn't keep being sick and you couldn't be sick this long. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. And so there was that constant theme of not being believed Mm -hmm. and not feeling I'm in the right place. And by the time I was 19 years old, I believe, I know it was fall of 1997, I had gone away to Virginia State. I did a, a student exchange program Mm -hmm. because I always wanted to visit uh, HBCU. I got accepted to many of them, just didn't go because of uh, finances. Mm -hmm. And I remember being there and I'll never forget it was, and I just got the date wrong. It was actually spring of 1998. It was Mm -hmm. Easter Sunday. We had gone to church, like some girls from my dorm and it was a good day. And I remember walking up the stairs and I almost tripped. And right then, I broke. I started crying and I cried for almost nearly 24 hours straight. Mm. Um, My mom was trying to come down. She's praying over me. Um, I'm telling her no. I refuse to talk to anybody. I was just in my room in the dark with music on a loop. And I was just in despair and I was just crying nonstop. Mm. When I recognized where, when I was able to trace it back after I had that episode, I remembered I had a really close friend at the time who was pregnant and hiding her pregnancy Mm. and she was in turmoil. And I had realized all of that maybe a couple of days prior to my breakdown. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the times when I really recognized that some of the things I'm carrying are me. And then some of it is things that I never realized I was, you know, when you're empathic, I I had the gift of empathy. I was taking things in with no portal for how to discharge them. I didn't know how to let it out. And so it it would come out in those sorts of ways and like depressive or anxious episodes. Mm -hmm. And then when you fast forwarded um, a very low moment, and I've talked about this uh, other times was in 2004, I was married um, in my marriage and my ex-husband was alcoholic. He he was going through his own things. And Mm -hmm. so There was alcoholism, untreated trauma, drugs. Even I found out later there was infidelity Mm -hmm. and I found out about um, the alcoholism I knew about the other things I found all about all at once. And I'll never forget August 26th, um, 2004 was my rebirth. Mm -hmm. I had learned that uh, my husband of at the time, it was about four and a half years Mm -hmm. had been cheating on me and. I had inklings. I knew something was amiss. There's a baby involved. There was a lot of drama involved Mm -hmm. and I just broke. Mm -hmm. I had been this in-home family therapist, healing and helping all these people. I was the go-to person for everybody. And I was just so broken and just Mm -hmm. so wounded. And I remember I had a, I had a breakdown. I had what what we call a nervous breakdown. Those aren't real clinical terms, but we call Mm -hmm. it a nervous breakdown. And that was my second one that I had experienced where I was shattered. I became despondent. Um, there was there was suicidal ideations, homicidal ideations. Mm-hmm. He had to leave because mm-hmm. there was no way that something catastrophic wouldn't happen. And mobile crisis was called. I used to call mobile crisis for other clients of mine. Mm-hmm. And they were called for me in order to save me. My sister was there with me and um, she was afraid to leave me, but I wanted mm-hmm. to be left alone. I had to agree to go into treatment and to see a therapist. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of my many spells into therapy and and medication at that time, Mm -hmm. because it was it was such a dark cloud that had been over me. And then from that point, it was a series of car accidents and different things Mm -hmm. that had happened. I had one in 98 that I almost lost my life. I had another one in 04, 05, 06, 07. And I remember my sister saying, it's almost like you have a dark cloud over you. Like, Mm -hmm. why are things happening to you? Later on, I recognized that there were so many things that happened to me. Yeah, but also for me. For you. Yeah. Right. So some of them may have been adverse winds, but a great many of them were things that were trying to get me to change my trajectory. Right. And so from 04, it went to me trying to do it, trying to make it work within my own power. Right. Mm -hmm. Trying to get better again. Yeah. but not patching up any of the things. So it was that constant hemorrhaging out of resources mm-hmm. with nothing coming back in. And the moment that, you know, took me down where I said, I could, I can't do this anymore. 
was the moment where I said, when did I become a lifetime movie? Mm. I was the go-to. When did I become the person who I prayed? My mother prayed for me for wisdom like King Solomon had. Mm. I know that I have godly wisdom in me. Mm -hmm. I'm using it and accessing it in order to help so many others. But not benefiting from it. But not benefiting from it. I had not applied it to myself. And that's when I knew that there was no lower that I could go from that moment. Mm. There was there was no lower I could go from there. Wow. So I, this is this is where I love this. This is where the conversation, this part of the conversation I love, because, you know, you're talking about that pit and being down and being low and, you know, uh, so many things have fallen apart. You're helping people, know, you know, and people are there to help you, but you, you don't have outlets to be able to uh, release these things. And you're at this this all time low. You said you even equated it to a, a lifetime movie, which we know. Lifetime yeah. has the same themes. Either they're doing a, a Christmas <laughs> movie, uh, you know, a Lifetime Christmas movie where they fall in love or, you know, it's some abusive husband or something that, you know, so they have two themes that they do. That's it. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So we so you you're you're sharing all this and I really appreciate the vulnerability that you're sharing. I want to talk about the bounce back, though, because yeah. that's the beautiful thing uh, I tell people all the time that. You're not really going to be okay until you hit rock bottom. Oh yeah. Um, you going down so far, you can go down, 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 down. But rock bottom, there's something that is powerful and pivotal, pivotal mm-hmm. about hitting rock bottom, and it's the yeah. bounce back. Uh, oh yeah. Even Tyler Perry talks about when he was homeless and he's sleeping in a car and he's writing these plays, he's trying to get things off the ground. But he was like, when he finally came to himself. Yeah, it's the bounce back that that is so much greater than w- the fall. Right. And so absolutely. I want you to talk about like, how did you go about reinventing yourself, um, leaning into your practice, your mm-hmm. expertise, your em- empathy um, and and making your su- your superpowers, uh, not just monetizing them, but yeah. also being able to. Uh, yield from them. You also allowing your superpowers to be your healing and yeah. your your breakthrough. Talk about that process with our listeners. Absolutely. So when it comes to those pivotal moments that that you know you can either bend and break and stay broken, right? Right. Or you realize I'm broken and I'm a shell of a person and Mm -hmm. this isn't who I was created to be. And you say, I'm going to get my bounce back. Right. Right. Uh, For me, what what that was, was, you know, people often talk about imposter syndrome and people talk about um, that feeling of getting back to who I was. Right. Mm -hmm. And and my thought process on it is a little bit different. And so when I think about like my thought leadership topics that I talk about, right. One of them is an intentional identity development. Mm. I was not intentional in developing who, who I was supposed to be, right. Who I believe I was created to be by our created by God. Right. Yeah. I, well, I was well, not break intentional. That down for us. Break, break Absolutely. That down. Yeah. So when you think about uh, identity development in the classic terms, it's more to looking at your strengths and weaknesses and your goals and, you know, values and things like that. Right. Mm -hmm. When you think about intentionally intentional identity development and where I look at it a little bit differently is I have a process and kind of like a thought methodology around it that's a little bit different. And so. I believe that there are stages to that that are very similar to like when you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Right. Mm -hmm. You have those basic needs of of food, shelter, but, you know, clothing, all those things. And then you have like um, being a part of being loved, being a part of things Mm -hmm. and belonging Belonging. and all those things. Right. But the top two. Right. Are like Mm self-awareness. And then the top one, the last one is self-actualization, which is supposed to be like this unicorn that Mm -hmm. a lot of times you may or may not ever hit. Right. Right. That that's the thought process. Well, for me, that is a very Eurocentric Mm -hmm. white cis cis male uh, perspective. And it makes sense because it's very patriarchal and it's how a lot of the homes um, come about. Right. Mm -hmm. Where men are taught to provide and protect Mm -hmm. because those are those two basic needs that we think trump all others. Right. The problem is they all should be happening continuously. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
absolutely. Yeah. And so when we get to these places where there's these discrepancies, right, mm-hmm. where we're in these discrepant places or our lives are incongruent with what we aspire, right? right? We have too much space in between where our reality is and what we, we said we wanted and what we aspired to do. Mm-hmm. A lot of it is because our identities weren't intentionally developed. Mm-hmm. Most times it's my belief that most times they are cultivated by our family values, right. our societal values, right. and even religious values that mm-hmm. we may or may not recognize are being placed upon us. So I believe that we are programmed to be right. how people were cultivated to be a way in which it works for our society, right. but not really. Right. And so I feel like we have these moments, usually when you get into your thirties, mm-hmm. somewhere around your thirties, you realize expectation is not matching up often with the reality, right? right. What I expected this would be like, right. is it matching up with the reality? And so for me, because that identity wasn't developed, it changed, it shifted the trajectory for where I believed I was supposed to go. Mm. The thing about it though is, and this is where grace comes in, and this is where I'm thankful for God, right? Mm-hmm. Because I could have sat there in 2004 and said, oh, I ruined it. That's it. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Instead, what I did was the bounce back came when I said, okay, yes, I made my bed and I lied in it, but I'm going to administer to myself some Mm self-compassion and some grace, right? Because God has already given me that. He's already forgiven me. Why can't I forgive myself for choices that I made that weren't in my best uh, interest, right? Right. So that's part of it. The other part of it is accountability, right? So I have these three A's that I talk to my clients about, but I also learned them back then. The first one was awareness. Mm -hmm. Sometimes y'all, the most dangerous thing in the world is being unaware of how we impact others and how others are impacting us, Mm -hmm. how things in this world are are impacting us, but also how are we impacting other people? I developed some awareness around those things. Mm -hmm. And then I did an acknowledgement, right? That's the second one. And my acknowledgement was I'm acknowledging the part that I played. Mm. Right. So for me, the acknowledge comes with some accountability, which is why I always say I will not have anyone in my space or in my life, business or professional Mm -hmm. that where there's not reciprocity and accountability. So my acknowledgement is me being accountable for how my actions or inactions Mm -hmm. led me to this place. Mm -hmm. I was not deserving of anything that I experienced. And yet I have accountability and I have to acknowledge that and saying, but I granted access to those that didn't deserve it. Right. And I tried to get my internal needs fed externally. Right. And that is how partially how this this happened to me. Right. The last part is acceptance. I had to accept that I can't go back and change. Mm-hmm. I also had to accept that even though I may learn everything I need to know, I will never be able to keep myself from difficulty or challenge. That's right. You know, I have a client that always says, Sheree, you told me. You can't stop the rain, but you can Mm -hmm. prepare for the storm. That's right. right? And I had to learn that. I Mm -hmm. had to learn how to prepare for the storm, which meant I had to build some resiliency. And Mm -hmm. I really had to say, when you're going to ask for trust and faith in God, that means difficulties are going to come because how will you ever know that you can trust them? Right. Right. And so in that space, I went back to school 2005. I took 19 credits. I And what the part that I didn't say is my low moment was I had to go on FMLA Mm -hmm. because my mental health had impacted my mental health and my physical health. So was so poorly impacted that I had to take off several months Mm -hmm. to be to be at home to do the healing work. And to go to therapy sessions, physical therapy sessions, because I didn't mention I had gotten another car accident Mm -hmm. the night before I found out about everything. Right. Mm -hmm. And so by that December, I said, I've sat out of school because I said, you know, I had credits left. I had more than enough credits to graduate, but not in my major. Mm -hmm. I went back to school and I had a conversation and they said, Sheree, there's a degree program right now that will take all your credits. It's liberal studies. We didn't have it then. Mm -hmm. We'll take all your credits and you only need 19 more credits. So you, before they were saying I needed like 40 more, Mm -hmm. 19 more credits. I signed up to do 18 of them because you could walk if you did, you know, if you only had a couple credits left, Mm -hmm. signed up to do 18 of them, went back to school at the time I was working in welfare to work and I was a a case manager. Mm -hmm. I went back to work. I worked full time. Mm -hmm. I was still with my husband at that Mm -hmm. time, right? But I told him, I'm no longer living for you and for this. I'm living to become what God created me to be. Mm -hmm. And I took 18 credits. So that meant evenings and weekends. I had to drive out to a campus that was an hour away. Mm -hmm. 
but I did it. And when I walked across that stage, which we walked across together, together. and I said, you know, I'm graduating with my little brother, but I was so proud that I didn't just give up and that right. I went through and I persevered and I made it. That was the first bounce back. The second mm-hmm. bounce back came when I decided I'm going to start a business. Mm-hmm. And so it was a low moment hitting my 30th birthday, my divorce being finalized. I had you know, been fired from my first job ever. Mm -hmm. Right. And that was a low moment. And I had to move back with my parents. Mm -hmm. Right. I could have stayed. My landlord said, well, we'll, you know, I'll work something out. I didn't want to struggle anymore. Y'all. I was tired. I was tired of the struggle. And so I went back and lived with my parents and I'm thinking I'm celebrating my 30th birthday and life is different now. This Mm -hmm. is, this is not what I expected my reality to be. I was married. I wanted to have children Mm -hmm. because I had polycystic ovarian syndrome. It made it quite difficult for me Mm -hmm. and I didn't trust my husband. And so Mm -hmm. I used protection to keep myself from having children. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, even when there's ignorance, there's grace. There's grace. And God allowed me to have some measure of wisdom where I knew to protect myself from that part. And so I remember saying, I don't have my marriage. I don't have my babies. I don't have anything. My dreams are in the graveyard. Mm. And I remember driving away 2005 after I had graduated, but I was leaving everything else behind. And I remember driving away and just crying. My Mm. aunt, you know, our aunt had just passed passed, and she was our closest aunt. Mm -hmm. Right. She was with us for every holiday, everything. And I remember Mm, just cheese on the earth. Nobody mac and cheese, ever, pancakes, mac and cheese. Yeah. French toast, everything. And yeah. I remember just weeping. Mm-hmm. I was I was weeping so badly. I was driving from Pittsburgh to Philly to take a short term job assignment. And I had left my um, ex-husband, who was still currently my husband. We were separated. I had left him in the apartment because I still wanted it. Mm-hmm. And I remember driving to, to Philadelphia and I had to pull over on the turnpike because I couldn't see through the tears. Mm-hmm. There was so much grief and mm-hmm. loss. And so I remember my perspective shifting once I got to Philly because I had my first college roommate. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Rumi. She told me, you can come here. You can stay. You know, I will help you get on your feet, whatever you need. And I remember this is prior to me being 30, y'all. So I'm backdating a little bit. I remember going there and I remember recognizing some things. I had had the nerve to get on a Christian Mingle site. Heal first, y'all heal. Right, yeah, and yeah. I took a true colors, a version of the true colors personality test. That's how I knew I was a blue back then. Yeah. And I remember looking at it and connecting the dots mm-hmm. like, oh, this is my personality. And then right. I took a Myers-Briggs and I'm like, oh, this is, oh, this makes sense why I was doing these things I, I was doing. And so mm-hmm. that's when connecting the dots and starting to formulate what my true identity was, was super important. Mm-hmm. Took that information and just started compounding. Mm-hmm. I recognized that my husband, while he, you know, wasn't a great husband, he was not a bad man. We are mm-hmm. all humans in this fragile space, on living journey. these on yeah. a journey. Yeah. And sometimes we collide and it's, it's impactful in a nasty mm-hmm. way. Right. right. And so when I thought about all the things that had happened, all the verbal abuse and the, the threats of physical violence and, mm-hmm. and all the things, what I recognized is when I met him, he was on the self-destructive course mm-hmm. and somehow in my desire to affirm myself, I see myself as a wounded healer. Mm -hmm. And so I worked tirelessly to heal him, which was to also validate and affirm me and my worth. Right. right. And so when I recognize that, I recognize the martyrdom Mm -hmm. and she won't like it, but she knows I said this. I recognize where that came from. My mother. Mm -hmm. Right. Who, who, who I loved and, and. I was definitely the girl that wanted to be like mommy when I grew up. I wanted to home like mommy, the family like mommy. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes the pitfalls we fall into is not knowing that what our mothers try to keep together to help us heal. Right. We don't realize the broken places that are underneath that. Mm -hmm. And we desire that thing that we see as the package. Right. And so in that space, I realized that I had become the martyr. God spoke to me and said, um, Girl, if I got up on the cross, Mm -hmm. I sent my son, got up on the cross for you. Go ahead, get down, Mm -hmm. right? Get down. And so my martyrdom was in vain. I went down off my little uh, pseudo cross that I had created that I kept Mm -hmm. getting up on. And I decided to be accountable to myself. That landed me in a space of every opportunity from that point on, from 2005 on, became an opportunity for me to grow from. Mm-hmm. When we almost lost our mother in 2009 mm-hmm. in a pivotal moment for me, because this is the closest person to me on the earth. Right. right? 
and I and and, and I'm, I, I might lose her. And a right. calm swept over me. Right. And I lived my life out loud in a different way. Right. From that point on, that changed the trajectory of my life. Mm-hmm. I took her lesson. That was her experience. Mm-hmm. But I took that and I said, life is to be lived. I don't want to be alive. Right. Just alive. I right. want to live. I want to and live. so oh. I made moves. I opened myself up to love again, met my husband that summer, mm-hmm. a few months after, um, you know, mom had the, the aneurysm that ruptured. Mm-hmm. I met my husband. I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina right after that. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't an easy journey. y'all. There were a lot of moments that I plateaued for a while. Yeah. But in that, what I remembered is I have to get to where I need to be to if I'm ever going to make the global impact that God has created me to make. Mm -hmm. And so with each step of the way, I persevered through. But I also said life isn't meant to be a struggle. So sometimes when I'm struggling too hard, too long, it's me that's in it. And so, again, freedom, flexibility. I learned Mm -hmm. that autonomy is a need of mine. Mm -hmm. So instead of me sitting in this space, I knew at 15 I was supposed to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. By 2015, I said, Sheree, you have to make moves to do it. And each time fear set in. And so I go back and work a job. Right. Right. And then finally, my freedom moment was in uh, January 2021, where we lost um, one of our dad's best friends who was like an uncle to us. Mm -hmm. You know, he he was an uncle to us. And I remember telling him I'm living my life in color even more so. Yeah. in more contrasted color because of you. I told him yeah. that in December. He passed in January when I was up in Pittsburgh for his funeral. I told him, um, I told the Lord, it's time. And I mm-hmm. called uh, the owner of my company and mm-hmm. the CEO and had a conversation with them. And I thanked them because they were great to me. I made it to clinical director. Mm-hmm. I persevered. I was no longer making $20,000 a year, y'all. I had climbed up the ranks. Mm-hmm. But what I knew is I had a gift in me that can't be modulated by just a company. And so that's where love and acceptance was born out of. It was Mm -hmm. the origin. It was my origin story. Yeah. Right. You know, people have villain origin stories. Right. It was my grace origin story. Mm -hmm. I created and founded Love and Acceptance. My husband decided that he would also come on board. Mm -hmm. And the whole goal of it is it's a parallel process. As our clients are going through their journeys, Mm -hmm. we're going through ours in my own individual life and within the marriage. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very authentic and very transparent and at times vulnerable not to co-opt and bleed my trauma onto my clients ever. But because sometimes people don't know that therapy in real life is happening. Yeah, there's mm-hmm. therapy, but then there's also who we are and how we're living. Right. And so I couldn't be the person I am today without all the things that happened. And yet everything didn't have to happen that way if I would have let go of the right. wheel a yeah. little bit easier. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's You dovetail all that together really nice. Um, my last question for you. Sure. Um, and then we'll do a call to action uh, where mm-hmm. you can give your social media and everything for them to follow up. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, 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 my last question is through this process, um, all that you've shared with us, how do you and how have you held on to hope? Mm-hmm. Um, you've talked about some pretty things you know, rough things that some people would have given up over. Some mm-hmm. people would have, you know, uh, definitely they would have done something tr- traumatic or dramatic. Right. Absolutely. And you have made it to this point to where you're still healing and you're still providing hope and you're still providing mm-hmm. counsel. Um, how have you, and how do you hold on to hope? So for me, I think it's 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 not easy. So I don't want to say it's easy and I don't want to act like, you you know, it's easy. But what I want to say is if we take from where we were and we look at it as scaffolding, right, Mm -hmm. as as climbing, then we understand that each point, each pivotal moment Mm -hmm. provides that next landing for the next step and the next step. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if we're patient with it, you know, Mm -hmm. I'll never forget worst car accident ever that I had in 98 where the car spun. Mm -hmm. It was because I panicked and I tried to gain control of the wheel. Mm -hmm. Right. And you all remember I talked about that rigidity. Mm -hmm. So in the space where you're thinking, okay, how do I hold on to hope? You hold on to hope when you remember that you got through the last moment Mm -hmm. and the moment before that and the moment before that. Right. Mm -hmm. So 
usually we have a past history of getting through things. And so that allows us to hold on to hope. The other part is when you truly know who you are, you know what your purpose is in Mm -hmm. life. You know, you're not leaving here until it's finished. Mm -hmm. I can't leave here Mm -hmm. until what that vision that God created in me until it's finished. And Mm -hmm. so I can hold on to hope for things that I don't have yet. When I went through the car accidents and the poverty Mm -hmm. and the poverty mindset, right? Mm -hmm. And the identity crises that I constantly found myself in and, and what, what happened with my mother with her aneurysm. And then I go to the, the later moments, which is, you know, for someone who is very nurturing to be childless and in your forties for Mm -hmm. a lot of women, that's a sense of, it's, it's a source of contention mm-hmm. and shame and embarrassment, right? Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you this, when I started my, restarted my journey to fertility um, on January of last year, mm-hmm. I decided to do IVF and I had a transfer scheduled. I knew the day I had the transfer, second day, I'm sorry, after the transfer, I knew the moment that my child that we had conceived in, through in vitro, I knew that that child had implanted and I told my husband. Mm-hmm. And so I remember hearing the first heartbeat, right? When we mm-hmm. heard Lovey, you know, we called her baby Lovey, when we heard Lovey's heartbeat, right? Mm-hmm. And I remember the silence and the stillness I felt some weeks later when I was supposed to be measuring at around eight weeks or so mm-hmm. and Lovey had stopped growing mm-hmm. and there was no longer a heartbeat mm-hmm. and everyone looked with, you know, they were afraid and they looked nervous and they said, I'm so sorry. And I said, it's It's okay. And I didn't know at the time if I meant it's okay, but I was just saying it, right? right? I felt, you know, like, okay, I I deal with, I'm really great in a crisis, right? So I, I knew mm. I, I'll be okay. And I looked at my husband, Dave, and I said, are you okay? He said, I'm okay, but why'd they say it like that? Well, what happened? And he was very confused, like what mm. could have happened? What could have occurred? And I remember the conversation with the doctor and I remember having to deliver the message to other people. And I remember just asking for space, because I'm an internal processor. And here's the thing, y'all, about when you know yourself, when you know yourself and you've done that intentional identity development work, you know what you need and you know how you have to access it. Mm. So I knew that I couldn't give out in the way that people, you know, sometimes when people are trying to comfort you, it is their own anxiety and it's their own need to be of service right. to you. And so they do it to you versus for you. For you. What right. I need in those moments is space and silence because right. first I have to go with me. And then for me, I go directly to God, right? I'm connecting to God and I'm, I'm figuring that out. And then to my husband and then externally if I need it, right? Mm-hmm. And so in that space, I, I remember thinking, I haven't cried to this day. I haven't cried, you know, around my miscarriage. Mm-hmm. And sometimes for some reason, you know, we think like the tears mean that's the grief. Right. And it could be, right? right? But I was grieving. I was mm-hmm. grieving a loss, but I was trying to explain to people how I wasn't devastated. Mm, right. Yeah. So I was saddened. I was disappointed. Right. You know, we, we have a one, you know, we have onesies still hanging up. Right. Mm-hmm. But the hope didn't dissipate. Right. I had created connections with people to go through this journey. Two other women in particular that I have, I, you know, we had prayed together as a group. I brought the two of them together mm-hmm. and I said, we will have our babies. We'll all be pregnant mm-hmm. within the next year. I knew it. Mm-hmm. Well, guess what? We all did end up pregnant. Wow. Now, one of them had to terminate the pregnancy, unfortunately, just recently. And it was a painful thing. And they're going through their own healing experience. Another one is just due to deliver uh, okay. this week. Right. Wow. Okay. Um, but I was the first one out of that group that got mm-hmm. pregnant. And I remember thinking, God, I thought we had a deal. Right. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I'm OK never having kids, mm-hmm. but I never wanted to feel the pain of miscarriage. I didn't think that I could handle it emotionally. Right. right? And then it happened. And then I remember, well, I didn't think I could, I could handle the what last thing. I yeah. knew was going to happen with my mom, right. but I did. Right. And, and he got me through. And so then I said, okay, Lord, we'll go back to James chapter one, which would talk about profiting from trials. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, God, we're back here again. This has happened. I don't know what is in your will. And we still have embryos left mm-hmm. in the fall. Right. Yeah. So I do still have hope. Right. And we did another transfer and it wasn't successful. And someone said, well, how can you carry that? Because now you're 45. And I remember talking to the folks when I did a CNN story. And I remember saying, I don't know how to have anything but hope because hope and grace and faith 
has carried me through. Right. And so what I will, would like to tell to your listeners out there is in those moments that feel so low and that, that, you know, you feel like you can't make it, what works for me may not work for you, mm -hmm. but if you can, and if it works for you, think back to the last moment you thought you wouldn't make it right. and remember how you made it. Yeah. And I remember that every, every, every trial that I had, God allowed me to triumph from it. Yeah. There was a time when I felt like I can't get out. I'm stuck. I'm hitting a plateau. Yeah. And then I built the business. And then I said, okay, I don't want to take insurance for this business because it's limiting. And I remember my husband who he always laughs and says, my faith is not as great as yours. Mm -hmm. And I was new in practice, only about a year in practice, no insurance with no way to really market. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying, I'm walking by faith, not by sight. So if I'm really going to have faith, these are God size goals that I have, not Sheree right. size goals. Right. And I remember stopping and saying, my hope is in the place of where God has created it. And I pray that it never dies. Right. Mm. And that business that plummeted and I was seeing less than 5,000 a month after I had quit my job, y'all. Mm -hmm. By December of that month, I was having five figure months mm -hmm. and working less. Right. And so I, I did this thing where I said, God, you show me how to create and orchestrate this business. Mm -hmm. You show me how to have congruency in my personal, professional and relational life. Mm -hmm. You show me how to be the higher, have the hierarchy in a way that serves you and also upholds the things in which I say that I want. Mm -hmm. How do I live them out truthfully? And so for me, it's non-negotiable to not have, and I, you have to be audacious with your hope. It's right. non-negotiable in a society that, really doesn't value people that look like me. It's mm -hmm. non-negotiable to not operate from a space of hope. Everything that I have is because I had the audacity to have hope. Yeah. And I trusted, believed, and had faith in not just who God is, but who mm -hmm. he's created me to be. Mm -hmm. And that's landed me here. So I, I have no other choice but to keep trusting it. Wow. This is, this is such a treat to talk to my sister and to see her in this light as this professional and expert in her field. And um, and just to, to have her share her heart in this way, uh, this is a really a treat to me. Sheree, tell uh, our listeners um, how they can best reach you. Where can they find you? How can they connect with you? Absolutely. So I tell people this all the time and it's not to be facetious, mm -hmm. but there's only one Sheree Lachoux in the world. So right. if ever you're and wondering, that that is the truth. Mm -hmm. And when I was Sheree Wiggum, you know, my maiden name, there was only one Sheree Wiggum. So if anyone ever wants to find me, and I want to say this for our listeners out there that may, um, may not uh, uh, be able to uh, know how, how to find me. My name is spelled S-H-E-R-R-A-E, -R -R -E, last name L-A-C-H-H-U. Google me at any time. An easier way to, to find me and find what's next for me is I have a link tree that has links to different offerings that I will have if you want to uh, put yourself on the wait list to know about offerings that I have if you want to see other things that I'm up to or some of the freebies that I occasionally give out if you're interested in kind of seeing what I keep within my ecosphere. Um, my link tree is uh, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E forward slash Sheree Lachoux. So guys, if you want to connect with me, I am Sheree Lachoux on all socials. That is LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitter. You will get a different version of me in each space, but it's all congruent with who I am. And again, that's S-H-E-R-R-A-E-L-A-C-H-H-U. My business name is Love and Acceptance, LLC. You type that in and you will find my website. Uh, for those who um, it works for, I do coaching. I do consulting work. Uh, coaching that I do is life coaching as well as relationship coaching uh, with my husband and partner, Dave. And then I'm also a therapist, but I take a very small uh, group of clients. I do typically couples intensives as well as individual work for those who want to do the identity work. I do individual identity work with clients who are individuals as well as couples. And so I offer complimentary consultations um, for that. And all of that information is in my link tree. So feel right. free to reach out. Well, thank you so much, Sheree. We really appreciate it. And um, I just want to say openly, publicly, I'm so proud of you. And I love thank you so you. much. Um, continue thank to you. flourish and prosper. 
um, even as your soul prospers. Love you, Ray. Thank you. Love you too. And I, I want to thank you again for inviting me on the show. And I also want to say that um, I'm sure you realize this by now, but we are our ancestors' wildest dreams mm-hmm. and we're our grandparents and our parents' wildest dreams. Mm-hmm. We are actually walking in the footsteps that they had placed out. Mm-hmm. And so I'm proud of you. I'm proud of the work that you're doing. Uh, you and our older sister, we are all in the space of helping people to find themselves and to mm-hmm. find their sense of purpose and clarity. And we do it in different overlapping ways, but the, the work that you've done and the scale of the work that you've done to sit back and witness it is a treat. It really is a treat. And I know those who know you to know you is to love you, but to be able to see you do it on that level, there's nothing but pride in my heart for you. Oh, yeah. thanks Ray. I appreciate yeah. that. Well, you all, you all have just seen all of this. Um, f- m- make sure you follow her. She's in the Charlotte area. Um, and we will be back with another edition of New Voices. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of New Voices. Visit our website at www.newutulsa.com. That is N-E-W-U Tulsa.com. Follow us on social media at New U Tulsa on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And a special thank you to our producer, Jesse Ulrich. If you're looking for self-improvement, join our free cohorts for personal and professional development opportunities. New U is a way for diverse talent to imagine, discover, and actualize a 2.0 version of yourself. Bring your future into focus.